Yeah, well, um, I'm Tibor Fischer. This is Boris Sakunian. Um, Boris Sakunian, welcome to the London Book Fair. London Book Fair, welcome to Boris. You've sold um, tens of millions of, of books, and the question I'd like to ask first, and probably some people here would like to ask the same question as well, is how did you do that? <laughs> it's a mystery to myself. I don't have an answer. In the beginning, they didn't sell at all. The first book, yeah, this one, was a complete disaster. The second, the third, and the fourth one were worse. And then something happened. You know, it's just, it's something to do with the stars, probably. Sometimes they smile, sometimes they don't. But you, you had a very distinguished career as a literary translator. Was there anything in particular that suddenly made you one day think, I want to sit down and write a novel? Yes, because uh, literary translation is uh, a wonderful profession. I loved it a lot. But still, it is a profession. It's a serious thing. A profession is uh, a sphere where you can, where you reach a ceiling and you cannot move any higher. And at a point, I started feeling that I will never be a better translation translator than I am now. That I'll translate maybe another five thousand pages, and it would be just going around the same circle. And I wanted to do something different. I wanted to try something different. Was, and uh, as uh, the only thing I knew was the alphabet and nothing else, so it had to do with letters in one way or another. I mean, reading the, the first book in the R.S. Van Doren series, The Winter Queen, um, I certainly had the feeling that you, you were trying to write a series because the, the central character is only 19 years old. It's, as it were, the start of his, his detective career. I mean, did you have the whole series in mind when you started? Oh yes, absolutely. I'm a very scheming person, and besides, I'm a child of socialist planned economy. <laughs> I had a whole, I had a five-year plan, definitely. I'm a very architectural, and uh, it was called a project because it was a project. It was planned as a project. It, it was planned as a whole constellation of a series, and this was just for starters. When I plan something, I plan something big. Otherwise, it, it, it's not always realized, but, it, you know, it's, it's a great thing, it's fantastic, it's very pleasant to plan something. For those of you who haven't read um, any of the books, um, the central character, Van Doren, is a sort of mixture of, of um, Sherlock Holmes and maybe a, a little bit of sort of James Bond as well, I suppose. I mean, what were the con were you consciously trying to emulate any, any previous detective writers or...? Yeah, it's typical of me when I do something, I try to do it cons consciously. <laughs> so, I planned him to be a bit like Sherlock Holmes and a bit like James Bond and a bit like Ninja Turtle. So, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I included in the formula some of uh, the characters of classical Russian literature which I like most. I don't like all of them, I mean the characters of classical Russian literature, but there are some which I love and I took a cut of each one of them and mm. added them in this cocktail. Mm. Well, have you ever read the Flashman books? Because I mean certainly something like Turkish Gambit reminded me a lot of the Flashman stories. I haven't read them. Oh, well, You should, they're very good. But, uh, I don't read fiction any yeah. longer. <laughs> Since I started writing it, I stopped, so it's too late. Oh. After I'm retired, uh, probably. Okay, well, it's, it's a, good, a good book for retirement. Um, what, uh, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, I think probably the one crime book that um, everyone in, 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 in Britain will know is, is Dosti, um, you know, uh, Crime and Punishment. I mean, that's the one book we've all heard of. What is the tradition of, of crime writing like in Russia? I mean, do you have much in the way of predecessors or is it something that only appeared after the system changed? Uh, this is a new, a recent genre in Russian literature because uh, before the revolution uh, it was just too early, nothing serious appeared, it was just uh, sort of cheap books, mostly it was translations from of Sherlock Holmes or of the French uh, detective novelists of the time. Then it 
I don't believe for 70 years in the most happy societies where there was no serious crime and you couldn't write a book about interesting crime. And uh, a cop always had to be a very good person, ideal person with the, you know, Communist Party member and all that. And the criminal had to be very awful and they, well, organized crime didn't exist, of course, so no Professor Moriarty was possible. We had all that in reality, but not in literature. Mm -hmm. So, and there was no book market. Mm -hmm. uh, book industry was planned as well, all the print runs. and So we came to a bookshop. There were thousands of books there, and you didn't want to buy any single one of them mm -hmm. because they were not meant for reading for normal people. Okay, so when we finally started to have book market, like 20 years ago, People were so hungry for crime fiction. First, they read only translated crime fiction, mostly American and not of the best quality. Mm -hmm. Then our authors started to write uh, detective novels. And they still are, well, the most popular genre on the Russian book market, mm -hmm. still now. It has well, I think partly it could be explained by the fact that crime plays quite an important role in our everyday life. We do have a lot of that entertainment around us, so... Yeah. No, crime pays everywhere, I think. It's, it's, um, it's a good profession to be in. Um, the question that every uh, writer tends to get asked, so I don't see why I shouldn't ask you as well, is how do you work? Are you a sort of... It seems to me writers tend to fall into two camps. There's the, sort of the planners and the sloggers. Um, when you sit down to write a book, how, how do you go about it? Uh, I have developed a technique which uh, has been changing with years. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I was under this uh, silly illusion that uh, an author creates a novel and uh, devises a plot and everything moves according to a, pl uh, a plot. After a while, I discovered that it doesn't function like this. You have to be very careful and you have to listen very carefully to what's happening somewhere you don't know and you just have to write it down in the correct way. So now what I do, first there has to be an idea for a novel. Just a little spark or a speck anything. Just a little trick if it is a, det a detective novel. And then you have an idea of a novel. And then you start uh, revising or no casting mm -hmm. uh, the characters. Uh -huh. They are important. You have a list of characters, and you create a story for each of them, even if it's just a very short appearance. Mm -hmm. You may call it Stanislavski system, mm -hmm. something like that. Even if he appear, appears for one passage, he has to be alive. He cannot be just you know a decoration. Mm -hmm. And after the system of characters is I finished... Mean, you keep detailed notes on each character? Yeah, I have a file for each of them, oh. my description, everything. And it's quite often that I have to look for a face. So I would find a face that I find in the internet. It can be an actor, a, a politician, whoever. Anyone here today, you think? Or? Oh, I'm having a look. So I'm, just, yeah. I'm always <laughs> keen on that. Yeah. So you are... <laughs> I think I'll use your face too. Yeah. So okay. then the next important step is uh, a step is to find the name for the for the character. Mm -hmm. This is very important. If the name is right, he wouldn't yeah. respond. It's, a, I, I, it's very strange. I find it's exactly the same thing. I, I can't explain why it is, but once you get the name, things fall into place. It is a mantra, so it has to sound right. So if they are all named in the right way, they start to have relations between themselves. And the plot is sort of, you know, this trajectory which is influenced by the force fields of all of them. This is the right way, ideal way, I think, to write a novel. It doesn't always work like this, you know. And how do you <laughs> start writing a novel? With difficulty is the answer. Um, you know, I, I'm sadly not, no, nowhere as near as prolific as you are. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, I suppose it's, it's, it's I usually start with an idea, um, a scene or something like that, and, and work from that. But it's, um, it, I, I certainly, the naming thing is very important for, for reasons I'll never be able to explain. Um, it took me, the other thing that, um, it, it took me a long time to twig, um, 
was uh, your your nom de plume, Boris Akunin, Bakunin. Um, I'm say it was two or three books in before I spotted that thing. Um, are you a big fan of anarchy? Why are you a great admirer of Bakunin? Not in the political sense, mm -hmm. in the art sense, definitely, mm -hmm. because art and writing in general is about breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. It should be anarchic, otherwise it's not interesting. And there is a lot of that sort of hidden anarchism inside my books, literary anarchism, mm -hmm. like mixing together genres that are supposed to keep apart, like um, mixing plots and illusions from different layers of uh, literature. This is what is meant, actually. Uh -huh. The other, the other thing that I found, um, one of the things I found quite interesting um, in one of your books, in Turkish Gambit, um, there's a scene which I think is, you know, very certainly very rare in in Russian literature, if not almost unique, um, where the hero Fandorin is um, uh, having a discussion with a young lady, a young lady of very progressive views, um, who's rather shocked to find that she likes Fandorin, who after all works for the state. Um, and Fandorin offers this defense of the state, which is something, as I say, it's, it's rare to come across in, 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 in Russian literature, whereas, in a sense, the history of Russian literature is conflict with the Russian state. So was that defense of the state from the heart or just for the character? I, also, I often use this method. I would use the good guy to express the ideas which I do not agree with mm -hmm. and use the, his opponent just in order to, to check my own views. How do they look when you, uh, when you try them uh, you know, without prejudice or without sympathy? Mm -hmm. There are quite a lot of episodes and scenes in my novels where the bad guys, the villains, the Akunins, uh, well, they sound... Uh, they make you think, maybe you are right and maybe my, my hero is wrong. This is what the whole thing is, is about. Although they are adventure novels, they are adventure novels for adults. Mm -hmm. It means that they are provocative in many ways, idea-wise also. Mm -hmm. What about, I mean, you're the, we know you primarily for the, the Fandorin mysteries, but you've... Um, written another ser series with Sister Pelagia, and also I understand that there's another Fandorin who's a de uh, descendant of um, uh, Erast. Uh, what, uh, do, you, do you find it harder or easier to sort of set a book in the present day? Uh, or, yes. Or it makes no difference? Yeah, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was a challenge for me uh, because, and I didn't think that it came off quite well. Mm -hmm. My readers are of that opinion. They don't like how I uh, describe contemporary Russia. Mm -hmm. why, why? What is it they object to? Because they, like me, live uh, nowadays and they can check my impressions against theirs and not agree. While when you write a historical novel, okay, you are the Tsar. All the people are gone. You can do what you please. <laughs> Nobody's going to say it. It was not like that at all. It's much easier, actually. Mm -hmm. the, um, the latest book to come out um, is The He Lover of Death, um, a book which I, I actually thought probably, in the narrative terms, was um, what, certainly one of the best, if not the best. Um, how do you, I mean, as a, as a literary translator you know, yourself, I assume you have a look at the translations. What, what do you think comes across and what is lost, if anything? This was an absolutely impossible novel to translate. And Andrew Bromfield, the translator, he did wonders, I think. Uh, in uh, this is a book uh, about an adolescent from the social bottom of the society who, whose glossary is very limited. He belongs to criminal world. It means he uh, uses a lot of criminal slang. And I had to devise, of, uh, to devise it myself. There are just a lot of words that do not exist in Russian language. Mm -hmm. They're just used in this particular gang. And in order to find an equivalent in, the, in English language, uh, Andrew Bromfields also had to create a lot of things. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I thought he did a remarkable uh, job. Um, Russia is the, 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 the theme of this year's um, book fair. How, do you, how would you sum up the state of Russian writing now? Do you have any view on that? Or? I don't. Uh -huh. Because uh, in the previous century, I used to be a literary critic and an essayist. I read everything. Mm -hmm. Since I started writing, I stopped reading. Mm -hmm. I read only nonfiction. I hope there are a lot of interesting things happening in today's Russian literature. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of friends who are writers and they seem like very talented people when I look at them. I'm going to read everything they write after I stop when you retire, writing yeah, and retire. Good. I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. But what about, I mean, what about the political situation? Because again, as I said, the, the sort of almost the history of Russian literature is, is a conflict between the writers and the state. Is that still the situation? I mean, how do, how do the intelligentsia feel in contemporary Russia? I can speak for myself, I can yeah. speak for intelligentsia. I think we are living through a very interesting epoch. Mm. There are a lot of problems. Uh, I don't know if, if we'll be able to survive them mm. <laughs> as a country and as a culture. But this is what makes it interesting. I think that... Uh, the general polit political situation in Russia is quite disgusting, mm -hmm. but at the same time, mm, I think that this is probably the best period in Russian history because now every everyone has an opportunity to make a moral choice on which side you are, without the fear of being immediately sent to Gulag or shot on the spot. Mm -hmm. So you risk maybe to lose your job or to have a sudden check from tax authorities it is unpleasant, but it's not a tragedy. Mm. So when someone uh, behaves in an opportunistic way, you can blame him or her easily. Mm. You don't have to be a hero in order to be independent. And this is very important and quite new for, for Russia, I believe. Yeah. I, mean, from, I mean, my knowledge of... Uh, I mean, I don't speak Russian and my, my knowledge is very limited. But it seems to me, in an interesting way, what's happened is almost a reversal to the czarist era. Is that...? I don't right? think so. No? No. No. It's just... There is a superficial similarity to the situation in late 19th century when after the liberal Alexander II, the reactionary Alexander III came, but I wouldn't be, well, too, you know, carried away by this similarity. Mm. No, what I mean is that it, it seems to be a sort of authoritarian regime, but they don't worry too much about what the intellectuals it's do. It's an authoritarian regime which is based not on fear, but on, you know, on the fact that people just don't care. No. But why, why, it's, do it's, it's, uh, uh, why do you think it is, it's turned out the way it has? I think it's normal. Hmm. I think it's natural. There is a certain, well, you know, there are certain steps of evolution of society, building a civil society. It doesn't, you know, come mm -hmm. with a snap. It goes gradually. So first, people want to provide for their families to make decent living. Mm -hmm. They've never had it in this country, in our country. Then they start to get interested in what's happening in the street. Then they start to get interested in what's happening in the town. Then one of the country in the world. It goes like this. We have to climb the whole ladder. But I mean, the, 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 what I find interesting is there's a difference between the sort of satellite countries, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, where it's certainly true that um, a lot of people from the old regime have done very well, have made lots of money, and are still in very powerful positions. But there isn't that authoritarian um, streak that still, still seems to be there in, in, in Russia. I mean, is it simply that the Bolshevik system was there longer, so th there's no tradition, as it were? I wouldn't blame everything on the Bolsheviks. Uh, of course, they were bastards, but, uh, you know, they wouldn't have appeared out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's a long-standing tradition of conflict between individual between human dignity and the state suppression. It has gone on for centuries. So it, it won't change uh, very quickly, but it is changing and I see it around me and people are changing. 
Russia is a country which has changed enormously in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Enormously. It's just an absolutely another country. In what sense? How has it, how has it changed? In a good sense, mm -hmm. I think. There are a lot of people who have become independent in mind. Mm -hmm. There are now tens of millions of people who provide for themselves and who do not hope for anything. They are really independent. They have, the, uh, uh, they have become the middle class of the country. They don't expect anything from the state. At this stage, after a while, they're going to ask questions. But we, have, we still have to come to this stage, I believe. Um, I suspect one or two people here may have some questions. We've got time for a couple of quick questions, if anyone would like to ask. Yes, the lady in red. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yep. This way. Uh, right. I know that you have your own blog, and uh, uh, you are a very busy uh, person. Obviously, how do you find time, even for that, and why do you do it? Because it seems to be like um, a leisurely activity for somebody who has loads of free time. I read your blog. I absolutely love it. And uh, I'm always wondering how such a busy person finds time to communicate with total strangers on so many different levels and to ask questions and um, why. Uh, I'll tell you frankly how we started. <laughs> uh, well... There is a time of the day between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. After 7 p.m., I start meeting my friends, drinking with them, or play video games. And at 5 p.m., I am tired. I cannot do anything useful, and I don't know what to occupy myself with till 7 o'clock. So I had to do something. And uh, the thing, the good thing about blogging is that I don't look at it as work. For me, it's just fun, it's entertainment, it occupies another zone of my brain. So, just enjoy myself. And uh, the most interesting and pleasant thing is that I get the response from the people, because writing is quite a lonely profession. You sit, you're always alone, and just there is the screen of the computer in front of you, you don't meet people. And here, I get letters, I see discussions, and it's very interesting, and I've discovered quite a lot of uh, new information about my country. It w it's quite an experience. I'm, uh, uh, the Live Journal, which is so popular in Russia, has been under attack recently. And uh, I'm absolutely sure now that if they, if they crush it, then we shall start something else. I'll go on blogging, it's for sure. Gentlemen there? The mic's coming. Uh, yes, Mr. Kunin. Uh, who, is, who is the best crime writer in contemporary Russia? And who is the second one? I did uh, hear I, I think, Was it the question, who is the best crime writer in Russia? Russia. Were well, you looking at him, I think. You know. <laughs> I need his, I need uh, who, who are your favorite crime writers, Russian crime writers? I don't read fiction, at and all. especially crime fiction. The best, the number one crime fiction writer in Russia would be the one who sells most copies. This is the only objective <laughs> parameter. So it should be Daria Donsova. Uh -huh. Lady in the hat. As a Georgian living in Russia, as a Georgian living in Russia, how do you view the situation between two countries? And uh, do you have any plan to include this big problem in any of your novels? Uh, the first time I was reminded I was ethnical Georgian was uh, when the conflict between Russia and Georgia started. I was reminded of it in an, uh, an unpleasant way by uh, tax police <laughs> who, who started something like a purge among ethnical Georgians. First, I was indignant because, well, I never felt I was a Georgian. I didn't know the language. I, uh, I haven't visited the country. But after a while, I thought, okay, maybe... Maybe it's going to be a discovery for me. Maybe I'm going to discover a Georgian inside myself. Why not? Well, I think I'll think about it. I haven't been to Georgia yet, but I'll go there sometime in the future, I'm sure. One more. 
you obviously have read, um, you know, your Russian classics and maybe even right up into the 1950s, into the Soviet area, Solzhenitsyn and, and um, Pasternak and so on. Um, who would you recommend um, as reading for writers, perhaps? Because I'm sure they must have influenced you somehow, even if it's subliminal. It depends on the type of character. If it would be someone more logical, I would recommend Tolstoy. If someone more emotional, I would recommend Dostoevsky. That's a good split. Okay. Um, I'm sure uh, we have to sort of wrap it up now. So, however, um, I'm sure if you ask um, Boris nicely, he will sign a copy of one of his books for you. So, I'd like you to put your hands together and thank Boris and yourselves for being such thank a good you. audience. Thank you, Tibor.